right, we'll get this microphone hooked up here. I think we're good to go. Let's see what we got. All right, turn the sound off. All right, hey guys. Hey, thanks for hanging in there with me. Cool deal. Looks like we are live and good to go. Just making sure that we're not froze up. For some reason, we had a little bit of a freezing problem last weekend, but that's okay. Looks like we're all right now. Cool. Well, how's everybody? We got a short class in here tonight. I knew it was going to be a little bit light. We've got, uh, got a big event going on here at the church tonight. We got United Night, which always brings out a bunch of people. In fact, I'll be heading over there as soon as we get done with class because it'll probably be going on until 8, 9 o'clock, I'm sure. Uh, but we got Drew and Cliff and Zach hanging in here with us, and we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Tonight's class is going to be a little bit different anyway, and I've already told these guys um, that you may or may not have saw the post last week about our CARS program that we have uh, finally kicked off and made official. And I'm going to spend the first half of tonight, probably, uh, probably half or so, talking about that and what we want to do and how you guys can help. And, uh, and then we'll get into a, a little bit of shorter lesson than, uh, than normal, and it's actually our very first one. So I went back and I went to the very first Fuel by Faith class that I, that I did uh, before we were doing any online stuff or anything like that. And I made a few tweaks to it and everything, obviously, because now we got a big screen and we got an online audience and all. Uh, but, you know, we're going to do, do part of that very first one. So I thought that'd be, uh, it was fitting since we're talking about getting started, I thought. Uh, hopefully we get some folks online tonight. I don't see anybody yet, but you know how that goes. Uh, if you guys are on there, as always, drop us a comment, you know, let us know how you're doing. And I make sure you can hear me and see me and, and all that good stuff. All right, cool. With that being said, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer. I don't have a prayer slide like I did last week, so we'll just go ahead and open in prayer right now and, uh, and then get started, So, <clears throat> if you would. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thankful, as always, that we get to have this time to meet. Father, I'm, I'm thankful for anybody who may watch this online, and I'm especially thankful for anybody who may come here and visit with us in person. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, put your blessings on each and every one of those individuals and put your blessings on this country as a whole. We pray, uh, we pray over our leaders. We pray over our firefighters, EMTs, first responders, military, all of those. Father, we know that they, uh, they are special to us. And Father, just pray with this um, message tonight that I'm going to try and deliver and it, you know, it would be used to, uh, to bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, cool. Appreciate it, guys. Now... Let us go ahead and jump into it, if this will change. There we go. Cool. So, who here has seen the, uh, the post about the CARS program? You have? You have? On what social media it was posted on? Facebook. Uh, no. No, you I'm haven't seen Facebook. it. Okay. All right. Well, that's cool. Uh, that's actually why I'm doing this, is so that anybody who didn't see it will get a chance to maybe see it. And, you know, this website is up on the TanglewoodChurch.com website. Uh, but we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight because I'm really excited to get this kicked off and there's been a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to make this happen and these guys sitting in front of me right hit right now are in for a lot of work also <laughs> they just don't know it yet uh, and if any of you guys out there yeah yeah somebody locked the door uh, <laughs> so uh, anyways let me change the rotation on here so it don't keep moving around so anyway, what we're calling it is we're calling it the CARS program, or Care and Repair Service. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, actually start a program where we can provide service work, repairs, and, uh, and things like that to families in need around our community. Uh, and we need to do that, you know, obviously with help from this class. It will provide hands-on training for anybody who wants to come out and help. And it will also provide, you know, hopefully a, uh, a blessing to someone else. Uh, our banner verse for this program is, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Uh, and I felt like that really helped, that really fit uh, what we're talking about and what we do here in this class in general, uh, because this is whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all. And so uh, most people don't think about turning wrenches as a way to, you know, give, give thanks to the Father, but obviously uh, it's in the Bible, so it is possible. We just need to find a better way to do it. Uh, so hopefully we're going to do that tonight, and that's Colossians 3.17. So, uh, a little bit of write-up about what it is that we're actually, uh, we're, we're actually talking about here. Uh, Tanglewood Church's Fuel by Faith Cars program is dedicated to sharing our God-given time, talent, and resources to bless our community. 
Our vision is to not only provide faith-centered education through our ongoing Christ-centered car clinics, which is what you guys are in right now, uh, both virtually and in person, but to take action to help when a need is present. As a group, the CARS program aims to provide no-cost or low-cost automotive maintenance and repairs to individuals or families that may not otherwise be in a position to do so. Um, so I think that's pretty straightforward. You guys get what we're trying to do here. <clears throat> now, I, th I really like the, uh, the tie-in that we, you know, we usually talk about maintenance items. We talk about tires and brakes and safety equipment and things of that nature uh, in this class. But there's been no real good outlet to actually get your hands dirty and actually get you some hands-on experience. <clears throat> so I'm really hoping that this is going to be a good way to do that. Now, obviously, none of that is possible without money right? <laughs> I mean, it's just the truth of the matter. Um, we are asking for you guys to help, and you're going to see a little bit later in this presentation that we've actually got some really, really, really good, uh, good companies on board already, and hopefully we grow that list as we move forward as well. But what, we, what we're asking for is that we need, uh, we need money to put toward these cars and to put toward parts. Obviously, this is not paying me as a technician or any other, anyone else. Um, you know, all the labor is provided by my class here and, uh, and you guys if you want to come and help. Uh, and we've got, a, we've got a really good shop on board to let us have a space to do it in. Uh, but obviously, none of that happens without, without money. And so we need, we need your help with that. So the Fuel by Faith Care and Repair Service equals hands-on instruction for our students plus community outreach for people in need. <clears throat> and this is a write-up that I, I put on our website, and uh, I'll go ahead and read it now in case anybody hasn't seen it. But we all know that car trouble can be frustrating, and in some cases downright dangerous. There are kids that need to get to school, and people need to get to work, and folks that need to get to the doctor's appointments that can mean real trouble if missed. As a group, Fuel by Faith's car program aims to provide a no-cost or low-cost automotive maintenance and repairs to families or individuals that may not otherwise be in a position to do so. This includes small maintenance items such as oil changes, tire rotations, batteries, and windshield wipers to more major repairs. Any donation made to Tanglewood Church can be directed to Fueled by Faith's CARS program as a tax-deductible deductible contribution and will be used to provide continued support in the form of parts or even entire vehicles. We appreciate your support in the form of monetary donations or by donating a vehicle that with some time and effort may be able to serve another family for a while longer. Any vehicles donated would be considered for repair to gift later or in some cases being sold to fund future repairs. Please consider supporting our ministry to enable us to give back using what God has given to us to help his people in the best way we know how. All right, that was a little bit wordy, but I really wanted to get the point across that, you know, what we want to do is, is use these funds to provide not only, uh, you know, small maintenance repairs, because let's face it, you know, some, sometimes those things can be a, a little bit taxing, you know, things are tight, uh, to more major repairs. And obviously anything given to the Tanglewood Church is a, is a tax deductible uh, donation. Uh, and obviously, you know, we would, we would use it the best way that we know how, and, and we've got a lot of leaders and everything in this church that uh, make sure that all of that stuff is, is taken care of. Uh, in fact, if you go to our website, which I'll have a link to in the description of this video, uh, it's tanglewoodchurch.com slash fueledbyfaithinfo. Uh, there's a great, great website there that Miss Stephanie Town put up, and, uh, and they have a direct giving link and, uh, and more information there as well. But that is the crux of what we're trying to do, and that's why I'm doing this video the way I'm doing it right now, uh, because we do need your help. That being said, we do have some excellent, excellent folks on board already, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each and, every one, each and uh, one of these tonight. Um, <clears throat> because I want to get their name out as much as I want to get our program out. And I felt like this is a good partnership and a good way to do it. And all of these companies have already agreed to help us in one way or another. And, uh, and I think that they deserve a little bit of time, you know, on, on here and in front of my class here. So we got DIY AutoTune, uh, East Coast Speed Shop, Gold City Tires, and Speedworks. Um, Gold, in full disclosure, Gold City Tires is my employer. That's the shop that I work for currently. Um, but this is where the work will be getting done as well. They've offered up, you know, use of a, use of a bay and tools and things of that nature where we can, uh, we can go and have class and, and actually work on these vehicles. Uh, but we'll talk about each one of them individually. So Gold City Tires, this is where I work. I'm sure Zach's very familiar. He worked there for a little bit too. <laughs> Sam and Aaron, if you're watching, you know, got a plug here for you, just saying. Uh, looks like we got some viewers online too, so drop us, uh, drop us a line, guys, if you're watching this, and let us know, uh, let us know who you are and, uh, and that you're checking us out. 
But anyways, so Gold City Tires is in the old Snipes Ford building in Goldsboro. Uh, we specialize in tires, alignments, inspections, major and minor uh, mechanical repairs, and the last, but definitely not least, the impossible electrical repair. <laughs> and I'm not, I think Aaron wrote that, and I really like it. But what we do typically, and you know, you guys have heard me talk about it here in class before, uh, is electrical and drivability diagnosis. That's really what we are known for, and that's uh, you know, that's kind of where where we we lean. Uh, but obviously, it's a full-service garage, everything from tires, brakes, alignments, and that kind of thing. Gold City has partnered with the Fuel by Faith Cars program, providing a workspace we can use to perform the work necessary on our clients' vehicles. Visit their Facebook page or call for more info on keeping your car running like new. So we definitely want to plug these guys, and I definitely suggest if you need any work done, any diagnostic work, electrical work, that kind of thing especially, uh, give, them a, give them a call, go to their Facebook page, and, uh, and let them know that you saw this on, on, our, on our live stream or uh, you saw it on our Facebook page. That would be a big help. Uh, but this is one of our sponsors. And then the other ones, we got East Coast Speed Shop. Uh, Zach and I stopped by there, talked to Danny on uh, Saturday, as a matter of fact, and we were hanging out. He had some pretty cool stuff out there. He's always got some neat stuff to check out uh, if you get a chance to go by there. Even if you just go by to say, hey, there's always some cool cars uh, hanging out there, supercharged Mustangs and, you know, big block Chevys and that kind of stuff. So there's always something neat. Uh, but Junior Dale and Danny Davis own, a, own and operate East Coast Speed Shop. They specialize in high-performance cars, old and new, and it's always been their passion. East Coast Speed Shop is partnered with Fuel by Faith Cars program by offering merchandise to auction or raffle along with Dino Time to be auctioned as, or raffled as well. And if any of you guys are watching this or car guys, and you're making all these changes and adjustments and you're throwing parts at it, you know, you just bought your cold air intake and your exhaust or whatever the case is, they have got a dyno, a Mustang dyno in ground. And, uh, and dyno time is expensive. Anybody who's ever tried to buy it or use it, you guys know that. It doesn't come cheap. And so they've generously offered up some dyno time for us to uh, raffle or auction uh, in order to help the cause. Mustang is in brand of dyno. Yeah, yeah. Mustang is in brand of dyno, not like the Ford Mustang. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's a super cool shop. Like I said, their address is up there. They're out on Highway 70 in Goldsboro. Uh, you can't miss it. You'll see a bunch of Mustangs and, you know, there's a Torino and a GTO and Camaro and some other stuff sitting out front. You can't miss it. If it looks like a place with a bunch of hot rods parked in front of it, you're in the right place. Uh, but go and holler at Danny. And I, he usually watches these. So hopefully he's online right now watching and uh, super good guy. Excellent technician, uh, engine builds, you know, dyno tuning, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, all of us here are car guys, and so it always pays to know somebody in that industry. And, uh, and if you want a job and you want a job done right, especially along those lines, you definitely need to check them out. Along those same lines is our, our good buddies over at Speedworks. Uh, Speedworks is very similar but on a different kind of car, I think is the best way to describe it. I'm friends with both these guys, and they're both in Goldsboro, um, but they do, uh, I, I wouldn't call them direct competition. Um, you know, Danny is awesome at doing engine builds and hot rods and things like that, EFI conversions, which we're going to talk about uh, a little bit. Anybody who knows me knows my heart is in EFI conversions. Uh, these guys do that stuff as well, but they typically do it on more of the import side of things. You know, if you've got a Civic or a Supra, uh, you know, RX-7 or, you know, whatever's in that picture, that maybe a McLaren or something in that picture. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you've got a 69 Nova with a big block that you want to fuel inject and add a bunch of nitrous to, go see our boys Danny. Uh, if you've got a Supra that you want to put a front mount intercooler and a big giant Turbonetics turbo on it, and, you know, maybe a uh, Haltech standalone, you need to go see Speedworks. <laughs> but uh, these guys are really cool. David Younger is the, the shop owner out there. Uh, him and his crew at Speedworks have partnered with us uh, with the program as well, and they are the premier import and exotic car repair and customization shop in the area. Uh, visit their Facebook page for more info and set up an appointment for all of your high-performance needs. And I also want to throw out there that they do a really cool car meet. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the second Saturday of every month. I could be wrong. Go to their Facebook page. Keep up with that. Uh, but I was just at one of their car meets last night. It's always a good time. That You never know what's going to show up there, man. Every, anything from McLarens to, you know, Miatas. It's a, it's a really cool mix of cars out there. Uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> I, do, I do love me a Miata, man. I'm not going to lie. But, uh, but, yeah, you guys need to go and check them out. And they, are, they have agreed to partner on us, uh, with us as well in this program. So thank you. Thank you to Speedworks. Thank you to David and his guys. Thank you to uh, Danny. Sam and Aaron at Gold City, uh, we definitely appreciate you guys as well. 
And there's one other one that I want to get to that I really am proud of. DIY Auto-Tune. So anybody who knows me, <laughs> anybody who knows me knows that, uh, that I love standalone fuel injection. That, you know, the three cars that you saw on that slide in the beginning, the RX-7, the 280Z, and the 72 Celica, all of those uh, I use DIY Auto-Tune components to put fuel injection on. Uh, well, actually put fuel injection on the Celica and, and replace the fuel injection on the RX-7 and the 280Z because it was old and crusty and didn't work. Uh, but DIYAutotune.com is a fantastic website. I mean, even if you're not into standalone, that's their main business. You know, the MS3 Pros, MS2s, uh, plug-and-play units, that kind of thing. But they also, also do a lot of, you know, gauges, tuning cables, uh, coils, ignition components, uh, sensors, and that type of thing. There's, a, you know, throttle bodies. You know, they do a lot other uh, things than just the standalone fuel injection, although that is what I, you know, they're most known for. Um, but Jerry Hoffman, the owner of DIY Autotune, has graciously, graciously, and generously uh, offered up a $400 gift certificate to DIYAutotune.com that we are going to raffle off. Um, I'm hoping to do that around November 1st, so watch the Facebook page here on Fuel by Faith for, uh, for a little bit more information on when exactly that's going to go down. But keep a close eye because uh, I wanted, I'm aiming for November 1st. But yeah, that's $400 to DIYAutotune.com, and that gets you a lot of product. I'm just saying. Uh, you could get... Man, you could get a lot of stuff on there for that, and we are very, very appreciative. Also, he's going to be get, throwing in a few of his books, uh, Performance Fuel Injection Systems. Uh, I have that book. I've had it for years and years, and it is uh, one of the best on aftermarket fuel injections uh, out there. Even if you don't use a Mega Squirt uh, or an MS3 or something from them, uh, that information in that book is still, is still really, really valuable. So we're going to be auctioning off that and raffling for the $400 gift card. So we very, very much appreciate all of those guys. And I see that Danny Davis is joining us tonight, so thank you. If you guys are watching and you see, uh, see him up there, drop him a line. You know, let him know that we appreciate him. With that being said, we can go ahead and get into our regular class. I told you it was going to be a little bit shorter tonight, but, you know, it was only about 15 minutes or so. We really do, uh, yeah, these are the three cars I was just talking about, actually. All of those cars use DIY components. Um, but we really do appreciate it. We really do uh, hope that we get this thing off the ground. Uh, we want, you know, to get as much support as we can. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're going to be having some events where we can auction off and raffle off these items that, uh, that they've been given to us. And if you own a business, if, you, you know, if you're a local business owner here and you want to get behind us, please reach out to me here on Facebook or billygerald13 at gmail.com. All of that is in the link for this video on Facebook. So if you want to, you know, get involved and put your name up here as well, we would very much appreciate it any way possible. Uh, but just think about it, pray about it. Uh, we would love your help on this, and we really look forward to being able to help out uh, other people in our community. So with that being said, let's get started. Ha. See what I, see what I did there? <laughs> oh, Drew, you're killing me. <laughs> so like we usually do, we'll go ahead and start out. Uh, we will uh, we'll go ahead and start out and with our verses as we usually do. And since we called this one Getting Started, like I said before, we, uh, you know, this is going back to the very beginning. This was uh, the very first, I think it was either the very first or the, or the second one that we ever did. Um, so hopefully you guys have forgotten all this information. This will be all new to you. But if not, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> so since we're talking about getting started, we have to talk about the beginning and what better place uh, then John 1, 1, 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Uh, and again, when you're talking about the beginning, it doesn't get more than the beginning than that, right? I know everybody thought I was going to use Genesis 1, but you know, I wanted to mix it up a little bit. Same idea, though. In the beginning <clears throat> was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so since we're talking about also getting started, I thought this was a good one, too, and things being made. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I, can't, I really like this one because of what we're talking about. We're talking about doing work. We're talking about generosity. We're talking about, you know, being, being a blessing to others. Uh, and this is really good because it says all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for these things. It's useful for teaching. It's useful for rebuking. It's useful for training. 
And why do you want all that? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I think that's a really good point right there is that um, you can do good work, but to be thoroughly equipped for good work, we need, uh, we need to go to the Scripture because all Scripture is God-breathed. So keep that in mind as well. And I know I'm talking extra fast tonight, but I'm trying to get through a lot of information. So bear with me. Uh, oh, I like this. Danny Davis just posted up. East Coast Speed and Billy Gerald will tune your car for free if you win the raffle. I like that. I'm on board, buddy. You got, you, got my, uh, you got my time on that. We can make that happen. You win the raffle, we'll get that sucker uh, put up there and tuned at East Coast, and you'll have, uh, you'll have everything you need right there. So, yes, get in on it. That's a good deal. So 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. And one other translation says, that person is a new creation. Uh, I like that. That kind of fits a little bit better. But I don't like to mix translations up on you too much. I always put which one I'm using right here. And my Bible is the NIV. That's the one I typically go with. But if I see it worded a little bit different in another translation, I will throw that in there. But this, again, is we're talking about getting started. We're talking about the beginning. We're talking about something being new. And this is us being made new in Christ, which I think I've used that uh, analogy before, but, you know, I'm a mechanic trying to tie in automotive themes, so, you know, to the Bible. They're going to repeat. <laughs> but does that make sense to you guys? You get it? And what I really like about this one is that they said, though, this is Paul writing here, he says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, no, we do so no longer. So they actually regarded him as, you know, just a guy, just a man, just someone of the world uh, originally, you know. And it's kind of crazy when you think about it. I mean, you look at what Christ done and you look at all the things that he did and all the miracles and all of this and, and for you to just say, ah, oh, he's just another guy. Uh, that's, that's a little crazy to me, but okay. Uh, but he says we do so no longer. And, that is, uh, and that's the important part is that we do no so longer because obviously Christ was not of this world. He was... It was uh, Definitely not just some other guy. So uh, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. I really like that. And Ecclesiastes 3.11, our last one for tonight. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. This one is really interesting to me. Again, we're talking about beginnings. We're talking about starting and that kind of thing. But... What I thought was pretty neat is it says he has set eternity in the human heart. And I've had that discussion with people before. And you ever wonder why, you know, over the course of human history, I mean, like forever and ever and ever, you know, people have always thought about an afterlife or, you know, some spirit realm or, you know, this, it's always been a part of it. Um, we, we, are, we have that in us, you know, naturally. I mean, they just, that's just what's in us. That's what God has put in us. He's put that... Uh, that eternal mind, that eternal mindset. He's put that in us. And it's really interesting that you look at it through all, you know, cultures and, and countries and things like that. All, all through time, there's always been something else. There's always been something afterwards, you know. And, that, and I thought that was really interesting. I mean, you look at like pyramids and Stonehenge and places like that. I mean, they put, put a lot of stock in that. And that's, that's really interesting. But God has put that in our heart. <clears throat> but no one can fathom what he has done from beginning to end. So that's a... Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting, too. You could think about it all you want, but it's not going to happen. You can't even imagine what's been done from beginning to the end. So I just thought that was a really cool one to throw in there as well. Cool beans. Well, we're talking about getting started, so we have to start from the starter, right? Well, that's what everybody would think, but there's way more to it than that. And we're not going to go over the, entire, uh, the entirety of this tonight. Uh, again, this was one of my very, very early lessons um, this is when I was still trying to figure out how to, you know, how this was going to work and if anybody was even going to show up, <laughs> you know, and that was well before we were doing online things. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely come a long way, but when we're talking about the starting system, we're not just talking about the starter and the battery. There's an entire system involved here. Uh, and this is a pretty cool illustration because you can see we've got the key with the immobilizer because all cars now have immobilizers or anti-theft uh, devices of some kind, which honestly have done more to aggravate technicians than they probably ever have to keep someone from stealing a car, <laughs> because these can be very, very aggravating. You know, if you guys ever had to have a, a key programmed or, you know, you lost one and had to have it replaced or, you know, had it cut, it's, it can be very, very expensive and very time-consuming. 
But we do have the key and the immobilizer. That's, that's kind of where we start. Stick the key in the ignition, you know, you turn it. Well, what happens after that? Well, then we got the car computer involved. Um, the computer has to decide, you know, hey, is this the right key? You know, are they trying to steal this car? What is the case here? And also, is it in park? Is it in neutral? Are we prepared to start? Uh, once the computer has decided that, yes, you know, everything's good to go, uh, then we're at, we've got some sort of relay, some sort of device that would uh, transfer low current to high current. And you see that's coming straight out of the car's computer. Sometimes it's from the body control module. Sometimes it's from the engine control module. It just depends on the car. But either way, when you turn that key, all you're doing is sending a request. You're telling the car, I would like to start now. Uh, or with pushing the button, which is, you know, more case nowadays. Um, but you're not... You know, it's not like the old days where there was a physical connection between the ignition switch and the starter. There generally isn't anymore. Uh, you are sending a request, and once all the parameters are met, once every, all the modules are happy, then it will send a signal to some sort of relay or some sort of current limiting device. And we've got our starter motor, which then uses the uh, high current power from the battery to actually turn the car over. But I wanted to start with this diagram because there's more to it than just turning the key and making the starter turn. So, you guys... Understanding that? Y'all with me? You with me online? I hope so. So, in the starting system, we've got a lot of components here. Drew, I would pay attention to this if I were you. <laughs> Does this look familiar? <laughs> it will. <laughs> it will in a couple. It will in a couple days. Uh, but anyway, so again, when we talk about the starting system, we're, we're talking about more than just the starter or the battery in the starter. Um, there's a lot going on here. We've got the battery. We've got the ignition switch or button in some cases. Uh, we've got the powertrain control module or body control module. Some sort of module is involved. We've got high current cables, you know, the big, big giant leads off the battery. We've got some sort of starter inhibit switch. If it's a manual, it'll be a clutch inhibit. If it's an automatic, it'll be a park neutral. Uh, we've got some sort of relay or solenoid, you know, to go from low current to high current. We've got the starter motor and we've got the flywheel or flex plate, which is a part of the starting system because without it, None of that matters. You can get all the way here, <clears throat> and if there's damage to the flywheel or flex plate, or the teeth are gone, or you didn't install it, or whatever, <laughs> it's not going to turn over. Uh, so, so with that being said, let's start. Let's talk about the battery first. Now, there's also batteries are one of those things where they look really simple. You know, it's a big heavy piece of plastic. You know, that starts the car, right? Well, there's a lot going on in a battery typically. And I know that this is really hard to read on the screen. Uh, I tried to do it, you know, clean it up the best I could. But I thought it really kind of gave a good illustration of what's actually going on inside of a battery. Uh, so the battery supplies initial energy to start the vehicle and stable, stabilizes the voltage once running. Highly sensitive to vibration and temperature. Generally measured in CCA or cold cranking amps, 550 to over 1,000. I've seen some less than 550 and I've seen some le more than 1,000. But that's the general range, you know, where we, where we live at. Uh, highly tolerant to being overcharged and constantly recharges from vehicle's alternator. These are all true of the lead acid or flooded cell type battery. Now, what, what is that you might say? Well, in a battery we've got these plates and we've got anodes and cathodes and they're all separated by these different, uh, these different pieces here. <clears throat> they call it a micropore separator. It's just a membrane. That's basically what you need to remember. But these lead plates, these lead uh, cells are positioned in six cells. So we got these stacks of plates. We've got six of them. And each one of them has a plate and a space and a plate and a space. And it's all, they're all flooded with an electrolyte. You've heard of the acid, battery acid. You know, it's usually, you know, it used to be like sulfuric acid. I'm not sure what kind of acid it is now, but it is an acid of some kind. And we call that the electrolyte. And what they do is they actually flood these batteries with that liquid electrolyte. If you ever picked a car battery up, you notice that, uh, you know, it, it sloshes around, sounds like there's liquid inside there. Uh, that's what you're hearing. You're actually hearing the liquid electrolyte sloshing around between the plates and things. Uh, these have some really big advantages and some really big disadvantages. So the advantage is that they're cheap to manufacture, relatively, you know, for a car battery. All car batteries are expensive to some, some degree. Uh, they can provide a very, very high level of cranking amps, uh, and they're really tolerant to being overcharged. And that, that becomes a factor, as you'll see a little bit later. But, you know, your charging system can fluctuate. And it moves up and down. Your alternator puts out different amount of, of uh, charge. You know, headlights on, headlights off. You know, at what RPM you're running, how much load is on the engine, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and these can, these can tolerate that really well. 
What they can't tolerate, though, are vibration and temperature. Because these, these are very, very thin lead plates, uh, and, you know, obviously they're, they're stacked very close together, any vibration banging around, you know, all that kind of stuff, it can actually shift these out of position, and if two of them touch or if they become sulfated and you end up bridging two of them, uh, then that cell is dead in that battery. And temperature, obviously, you know, if it's really, really cold, they don't, they don't do as well, and if it's really, really hot, they don't do as well. So these, these are a little bit sensitive, and also, you know, if they turn over, if they get punctured, uh, you know, if they're upside down or something like that, then, you know, the electrolyte can spill out. So they do have some disadvantages, but they do have some advantages. This is, a, this is probably the most common type of battery out there now, but it's quickly being replaced with the AGM battery. This is what we're seeing more and more of nowadays. Anybody ever seen like a, like a Optima battery or something like that? You know, it's, it's a solid battery or not, I mean, it's not solid state, but it's a, uh, doesn't have liquid floating around in it for the most part. There is some liquid, but it's not like a flooded cell battery. So AGM or absorbed glass matte battery vibration resistant and can be used in any position extremely long life with very low self discharge rate maintenance free meaning no requirement to add water or electrolyte very sensitive to overcharging requiring many vehicles to use battery monitoring systems spill proof and leak proof so these are really cool because as the name suggests absorbed glass mat the electrolyte is actually absorbed by fiberglass mat and it's still built with cells and with plates like uh, like the other one uh, well, some of them are spiral cell. That's why they look like a six-pack design, you know, like an Optima battery. But a lot of times you'll see them, they look just like a standard battery. Uh, but they don't slosh around, you know, like a, like a lead-acid battery does. Uh, and that's because the electrolyte is actually absorbed into a fiberglass mat. And the nice thing about that is they're, they're maintenance-free. They don't, you don't have to add anything to them. And they can work in any position. You can turn them upside down. You can lay them on their side, you know, whatever the case. Uh, and there's nothing to spill out of them. Uh, and they, they're very, very resistant to vibration. That's why you usually see them on race cars and things like that, because vibration doesn't, doesn't kill them. You know, all of that fiberglass matting is absorbed in there, and it's just, a, you know, acts like a solid piece. But sensitive to overcharging and requiring vehicles to use battery monitoring systems. So this is something that can get you in trouble. Let's say uh, you, you had a BMW. <laughs> and I use that example because I do. Uh, they, you know, some of them come with, from the factory with AGM batteries. They come from, you know, the factory would absorb glass ba batteries. Well, they have a sensor on the battery cable that can actually monitor how much uh, amperage is being used and how much is being put back into that battery. And they use that to control the alternator. Uh, the reason being is because they're very sensitive to overcharging. So when you load it up, when you turn the high beams on, the wipers and the blower motor and AC and everything else, and you need a bunch of power, it allows the alternator to produce poor current. Uh, when you're just driving down the road on a nice sunny day with the windows down and everything off, it needs less current, and so it can control that charging system. Now, let's say that you were just to take one of these batteries and throw it in any old car. A lot of times you'll find that old cars tend to overcharge them, uh, and these need to be charged very, very slowly, and, you know, very, and they need to be monitored while they're being charged. Usually, if you have a battery charger at home, uh, it will have a setting on it, you know, to say AGM. Uh, it will have a different charge rate for one of these batteries. Marine batteries are a good example of that. Uh, if you've got trolling motors on your boat or whatever the case is, you usually see uh, AGM batteries in that application. And those chargers are very specific for these type of batteries. And those, those battery monitoring systems can cause problems too because if, if the car can't monitor it, sometimes they won't let it start at all. Um, but yeah, if you see something hanging on your battery cable, it looks like a little box, it's got some small wires on it or whatever, you know, don't just cut it off or anything like that because that means it's probably using a sort of battery monitoring system to control the alternator so it doesn't overcharge the battery. The nice thing about these two is that they can be run really low and still produce the same amount of power, but it takes them a long time to come back up. Lead acid batteries tend to hit really hard for a short amount of time, but once they get below a certain amount of charge, they're generally, they're, they're generally no good or it's very hard to get them to come back up. So there is an advantage here. But it's something you do have to be careful for, with. You can't just throw them in any old thing. Anybody's battery look like this? I'm sure somebody's out there does. <laughs> uh, if you've seen batteries, you know, old cars especially, you've probably seen this type of corrosion uh, going on. Uh, typical points of battery failure, the cell connector inside, actually you see that corro uh, corrode. Loose hold downs, 
Why is loose hold down a failure? Because that's vibration, that's movement. That means this battery is shaking around inside the car. Uh, we already know that lead-acid batteries don't like vibration. Uh, corrosion. Corrosion is a big one. Frayed or broken cables. If your cables look like that, please change them. Do something. <laughs> it's a fire waiting to happen. Uh, cracked cell cover. You know, again, the plastic can crack, and we talked about that. There's a liquid electrolyte inside of there, uh, and you actually see that leak out in some cases, which is really bad news. Uh, and then water. And it shows water here as a typical point of battery failure, and there's a couple reasons. One, it can boil over, and you see water up on the top of here. Or two, if that thing stays wet all the time, you actually get discharge between the terminals because water is conductive. So you need to make sure that this stays, you know, in a battery box, dry. You know, most of them, you know, modern cars are typically under in the trunk, under the seat, in the fender well. You know, modern cars, they're in, they're all kinds of weird places. Uh, but for the most part, you do want to keep them dry. Corrosion on the terminals is due to hydrogen gas being released from the acid in the battery. And I'm going to zoom in on this for you guys. It mixes with other things in the atmosphere under the hood and produces the corrosion you see on the terminals. Generally, if the corrosion is occurring on the negative terminal, your system is probably undercharging. And there's a whole chemistry to why that is, and I'm not exactly sure why that is, but an undercharging system will typically tend to corrode on the negative side and an overcharging system will typically uh, corrode on the positive side. Uh, what we have going on here with this guy's battery is, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> it's corrosion everywhere on that one. <laughs> but, just, uh, but just keep that in mind. Corrosion is obviously not conductive or less conductive, and so you're actually uh, building up a lot, a lot of resistance there with that corrosion on them. And not to mention it's actually eating the metal on the terminals. So if your battery looks like this, you know, we need to do something about that. Not a good situation. Testing a battery with a voltmeter. This is, this is kind of interesting because I told you earlier there are six cells in a battery. Each one of those cells is capable of producing 2.1 volts uh, when fully charged. And that's a pretty universal deal for 12 volt car batteries. Each cell is about 2 volts. So 100% charge would be right at 12.6 or 12.7. Uh, and then we can see where it's actually dropping down. So if you take a voltmeter and you put it across the negative and positive lead on your battery, you're actually going to get a reading, you know, somewhere around in here, hopefully. Hopefully it's not less than that. <laughs> uh, but if you don't have a battery tester, you don't have anything like that at home, uh, but you do have a voltmeter, I mean, you can get them at Harbor Freight or whatever, they're pretty cheap. Uh, and you can actually test to see what the state of charge is on your battery. Now, this chart, I didn't make this chart, and there's one caveat that I would add to it. Some batteries will build up a surface charge, and so, you know, you'll see a uh, maybe 13 or 12.8 or something like that, you'll see a surface charge when you initially put the, uh, put the meter across it. Uh, so really correctly what you should do is maybe turn on, you know, the headlights or, uh, you know, the blower motor or put on some load on the battery and then turn it back off and then test it. And that will get rid of that surface charge because, you know, the, the air between them, you know, I, I guess, I don't know if it's going across the case or if it's going across the air. I'm not sure exactly why, but they do build up a surface charge sometimes. So you can get a false reading if you just walked out to a car and stuck the meter on it. You want to, you know, turn something on first and then take the load off of it, and that should clear that. Uh, but again, you know, you can see this from 12.7 to 11.9 is a big jump. You know, if I saw, if I went out there and saw a battery and I tested it, you know, I put a meter on it and I saw that it was, you know, 11.9, I'm like, man, that's, yeah, that battery's probably pretty good. And it probably would start the car. I mean, honestly, 40%, 40% of, uh, of its state of charge, it probably would start the car. Uh, but you see here, if I see 12.5 or 12.6, now you're, you're talking, that's 50%. That's 50% of its uh, state of charge right there in just that little bit. And so that's why it's really important. You can't just look at it and say, oh, it's got 12 volts, it's fine. Sure, it might be fine, but that doesn't mean that it's fully charged. Um, so it's very, very important to remember that it is, you know, every tenth of a volt does make a pretty big difference. And then obviously as you get down into these ranges, you know, I doubt the car would even start down in this range. It might, but, you know, that's just something to keep in mind, so. Okay, cool. That's batteries. That makes sense to you guys? I think we're making pretty good time. We're going to, I think we're going to do this. <laughs> Y'all still with me? You still with me online? I hope so. Uh, well, ignition switches. Now, we talked about it before. When you turn the ignition switch on a modern car, and when I say modern, I mean like, what, 2000s and up, maybe 90s, mid-90s and up. Um, you know, most of them are, are still just sending a request. You know, on an old car, yeah, you got all that current from the battery to the ignition switch. 
you turned it and it went from the switch out to the solenoid and it kicked the starter over. They don't do that anymore. The wire's too heavy, costs too much, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, they really are trying to cut down on the wiring on these cars. Um, I can't imagine the day that, it, you know, everything's Bluetooth, you know. It's all like Wi-Fi headlights and stuff. I, I, you know, I don't know. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that's coming. Uh, but when we talk about the ignition, ignition switch, you know, most people, that's what pe most people think when they say ignition switch. The part that you put the key in. It looks exactly like that. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, that's just a part of it. That would be the lock cylinder with keys. And th this is a parts guy's age-old nightmare when somebody calls up to the parts store and says, hey, I need an ignition switch for an 87 Ford F-150. Do you mean the lock cylinder or do you mean the ignition switch? <laughs> because that's, most people uh, relate this to the ignition switch. But typically a car will have a lock cylinder with keys, uh, and then that will actually actuate an electrical part of the switch. Sometimes that, that's attached right to the back of the lock cylinder. Sometimes there's a rod that goes down the steering column and, you know, actually actuates an electric part of the switch. Uh, some, you know, Chryslers, they got little pins and things that move around and actually uh, move the electrical side of the switch. But on just about everything that I can think of, the lock cylinder and the electrical part are two separate pieces. So I wanted to throw that in there so you guys would just have that little bit. And then obviously with uh, push button starts, it's just a solid state. It's all done by computer. All you're doing is just sending a request when you push that. Um, that's, you know, two very, very small wires and two to make it light up. And when you push it, the computer decides whether or not the car starts. So really you have no, you have no say in it. And these things, <laughs> they have their own set of problems actually. Uh, most modern cars that don't have an ignition lock cylinder like this, and have a push button, well, they still have a steering column lock. Uh, anybody out there has got a Range Rover, Mercedes, BMW, anything like that, well, those steering column locks can fail. And when the steering column lock fails, the car won't start because it doesn't know if the column locked or unlocked, uh, which is really super annoying. So <laughs> you get in it, you hit the button, and you know, even though the column might be unlocked, it didn't see it move because maybe it doesn't work or you know, they are prone to failure. Uh, and it won't allow you to car to start because it says, nope, we don't know if the column locked or, or is unlocked, and so we're not going to let you uh, start the car. So, yeah, those things can be, like I said, anti-theft systems have caused mechanics more grief than they've ever foiled thieves, I'm pretty sure. With the push-button start deal, like we were just talking about, we've got our button, which is really just, a button it's just a very very low current it's a you know a logic level um, you know wires and everything going to that very very small no no real current going on there all you're doing is uh, sending a signal typically what you're doing is that will have uh, you know resistors in it and when you push it the powertrain control module is monitoring that line and when it sees a change in state then it says okay somebody's pushed the button what do they want to do and then you know you push it again and it goes on and you push it another time and it goes off or you hold it and it comes on or whatever the case is. But the PCM is monitoring that line all the time. So all it's doing is just seeing a change of state on that line. Then we go to our PCM or BCM in some cases, uh, but we go to the control module. Like we talked about before, we've got park neutral switch and a brake pedal switch. That's another one that's added on to these push button cars that you typically don't see. Uh, you typically don't see that in a regular car with a key start. Usually you don't have to push the brake pedal. Uh, BMW 5 Series with a key, you do have to push the brake pedal, so there are some out there. But most of the time with a push button start, we've always got a park neutral and we've got a brake pedal. And if it's a manual, you know, it'd be a clutch and a brake pedal. So you actually have to push the brake before the car will actually start. Then we get to our starter solenoid and then to our starter motor. But I wanted to put this up there because, like I said, that's just one more point of failure. If you are diagnosing a car that, you know, is a no crank and no start, uh, and, you know, you, you're looking at the PCM and you're saying, you know, okay, it sees that the ignition switch changes and I know the car is in park and why won't it start? Pay attention to the brake because, you know, if, if that part, if that component fails, that will keep it from starting. So, you know. No, 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 not on all cars. Just, uh, like I said, mostly all of them with push button starts, but, you know, uh, I have seen just a handful, well, just one really, that I know for a fact you have to push the brake to start, and that's, uh, that's the BMWs. Mercedes is probably the same way. But most cars, you can, you know, if it's in park or neutral, you can reach in the window and crank it, you know, if it's an automatic. So, don't, I wouldn't recommend it, though. It might run you over. 
<laughs> so we're talking about the starter motor. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do all right here, I think. Uh, the, it's an electric motor used to rotate an engine until it can sustain operation under its own power. It contains an electromagnetic solenoid to engage the drive gear with the flywheel or flex plate, along with an overrunning clutch or bendix to disengage the drive gear when engine speed is met. Can use up to 250 amps while starting an engine. That's the big deal. These things are high amp motors. You know, you've seen the cables that are on a battery. They're very, very big. And batteries can produce, you know, a lot of amps, over a thousand uh, in some cases. Uh, well, this motor is actually responsible for spinning that engine until it is spinning fast enough for combustion to take over and it can actually run under its own power. Modern cars with direct injection do this a lot quicker than old cars did. A modern car with direct injection, it knows what cylinder, it knows every cylinder position, it knows what cylinder needs to fire next, it knows what spark plug needs to fire next, and so as soon as you turn that key, it hits them in the order that it left off in, and they usually fire right up really quickly. Old cars, you know, pump it, <laughs> and fight them for a while. Uh, and so these things actually got a heck of a workout. They've gotten smaller over the years. You know, this is a more modern one right here. It looks like maybe a Honda or something like that. Uh, and they, but engines have gotten more and more compression over the years. And so this, the job of this starter has become a lot harder. Uh, and again, it's an electric motor. It's got windings and everything in there, just like any other electric motor. But when we're talking about the electromagnetic solenoid, what we're talking about is actually, this is the solenoid here, and there's an actual arm or uh, linkage, if you want to call it that, that runs from here to here. So when you turn the key, what you're doing is actually engaging a magnetic field right here, and it pulls this linkage out. It actually kicks this gear out toward the end of the starter. At the same time, when it kicks over, there's two contacts in there that touch and allow high current power to flow from the battery through the starter. So that high current, that 200, 300 amps, isn't going through your ignition switch wires. You know, that's, it acts like a relay. You know, it's a solenoid, it's the same thing. Um, some cars have a relay and a solenoid. You know, Fords just have a solenoid. Uh, but for the most part, what you're doing is you're actually energizing a magnetic field right here. Anybody ever got in a car that wouldn't start and it just goes click, click? <laughs> push button like a 55, he says. Yeah. <laughs> Danny Davis says push button is a joke. Dude, I've had my... I've had my share of fights with push button start systems, no doubt about it. Um, but anyways, so what you're doing is you're actually engaging a magnetic field here. And as that magnetic field pulls this Bendix over, it actually uh, makes those contacts. At the same time, it's kicking this gear out toward the end so it can actually engage the flywheel. And then the big motor part spins the engine over. Like we said, it has to have some sort of overrunning clutch to kick it back the other way. Uh, otherwise, this would stay engaged, and I've actually seen that happen before. Uh, when the starter stays engaged, well, now that motor becomes a generator, and it will cook these wires. <laughs> it will cook the starter. It will cook the wires. Uh, it does a lot of bad things because now the engine is driving this gear, and it's spinning that starter motor really, really fast. And, you know, it's, it's just a magnetic, uh, you know, motor. It's just an electric motor, so it doesn't care. It's going to produce electricity if it goes that way, and it's going to produce power if it goes this way. So... You can't actually burn a lot of stuff up by those things staying engaged. So just keep that in mind. If you ever get one and it just clicks, click, 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 but doesn't turn, that's usually what you're hearing. You're hearing that solenoid click because it's trying to pull that, uh, it's pulling that Bendix <laughs> over, and if the contacts are no good inside of it, then that current can't flow through the motor part, and that's why it doesn't turn. That's why sometimes you can get a big screwdriver or a pry bar or something and beat on them, and they'll, they'll go ahead and fire up <laughs> because, uh, because you're actually getting that contact to to actually work. But here's a little breakdown of a starter, just you know, kind of give you a better idea what I was talking about. You see that we've got the field windings here, again, just like an electric motor. Any, uh, any old electric motor would have, would have windings very similar with brushes in the back. Uh, and then this is the solenoid I was talking about. You can actually see this actuating arm. And as you turn the key, you, you engage a magnet inside here that actually pulls that on this pivot. And you see how that would push the pinion out toward the end. Does it make sense? I thought that was a clearer illustration of what I was talking about. And electric motors are a uh, whole other subject. We'll have another class on those, actually. But just keep in mind, this is just a big electric motor, a really, really high current one. And we need this solenoid here in order to 
you know, make sure that that high current doesn't flow through our switch wiring and body controllers and all that kind of good stuff. And then a quick thing on the flex plate and the flywheels. We talked about this in the manual transmissions class and we talked about it in the automatics class. So if you're out there online and you didn't, you missed both of those, you know, go to YouTube, check them out. Um, but again, you know, flex plate is generally considered, uh, you know, automatics. They're called flex plates. Some people will call this a flywheel. Again, if you go to the parts store and you say, I want a flywheel for an 89 Jeep, they're probably going to sell you a flex plate. <laughs> it just depends. Uh, but, you know, with an automatic, it's very, very thin. Uh, it's, you know, it's just a way for the engine to connect to the torque converter, uh, but it will usually always have the starter ring gear made to it. Some cars, the starter ring gear is made on the torque converter itself. I know there's an exception for every rule, especially when you're talking about cars. For the most part, though, it's the starter ring gear is either going to be on the flex plate or the flywheel if it's a manual transmission car. Uh, again, these are, th you know, made out of metal. They can wear, they can become damaged. People can pry on them, you know, and break teeth off. Uh, you know, you get stuff stuck in there and it chews it all to pieces. Uh, I've seen these things crack. Uh, sometimes <laughs> I had one where it cracked and so the outside would turn, but it wasn't turning the crank. Yeah. Uh, they crack and sound like broken rods sometimes. Danny, if you're still watching, I know you've heard broken flex plates sound just like a daggone rod knock. We had a big um, box truck at RNS. Yeah. It was broken where the bolts are, like in the center like that. Mm -hmm. But only enough to where you could drive it in, but it, it did sound like a rod knock. Yep. I've seen several of them that would do that. They will start, but they will, I mean, you would swear it's a rod knock. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jeep, Jeeps are bad for that too. I've seen several of those. Uh, but these teeth can become damaged, and you know you hear them sometimes. The starters will zing, you know, you hit the key and it goes zing because it missed the teeth, or the teeth were damaged. Make sure I don't have any more questions on here. Um, and like I said, they can become wore out just with with mileage. And it's really important that you be careful if you are prying on them. A lot of people like to you know turn the engine over with a screwdriver or something. Just be careful when you're prying on them because if they do become damaged, then it could damage the starter. Uh, I just included this. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. We were talking about high current versus low current, and this uh, doesn't really go along with what we're talking about, but you can see right here your regular 14-gauge AWG wire. That's typically what you would see in an automotive application, you know, 14 to 18, even a little bit smaller than that, 20 in some cases. Uh, but that's good for about 20 amps. And we see our 1-gauge good for about 125 amps. Uh, so you can see how big that wire needs to be to can handle that kind of amperage. So if you're installing, you know, a starter, or if you're doing something custom that you know is going to be high current, keep in mind the gauge of wire you use. You'd be surprised at how many people I see use too small of a wire uh, for a very, very high amperage uh, application. But at the same time, you know, if you're putting in a set of fog lights or whatever that may pull 25 amps, you don't need to run the whole thing with, you know, two gauge AWG uh, out to the front of the truck. I mean, you know, it's just going to be heavy, expensive, hard to work with. Uh, yeah, there's no reason to, to, to go like that either. So, you know, keep in mind for what you're doing, the application that you're, uh, that you're doing is, is what wire size you need to use. And this is just another cool uh, illustration along those same lines. You saw that the bigger wire, you know, was able to hold a lot more amps or carry a lot more amps. Well, with a the longer the wire, it can affect it as well because now we're talking about the resistance of the wire. And so you can see where, you know, you get out here to 16 to 19 feet, uh, 35 amps, you need an 8 gauge wire. Whereas, you know, if you're at 4 to 7 feet, you'd only need a 10 gauge wire. Uh, same thing up here, you know, 250 to 300 amps, 2 gauge wire versus, you know, a 4 gauge wire. So length has a lot to do with it as well. So keep that in mind. If you're running like a fuel pump or something to the back of the car, or some, if you move the battery to the back of the car and you need to run starter cables to the front, uh, you need to keep in mind that if you do that, you probably need to step up a gauge and wire. Because most batteries, then when they're mounted in the front, they're within, I don't know, 30 inches of the, of the starter or something like that. And you put it in the trunk and now all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10 or 12 feet of wire. Uh, that's a big, big difference. So, you know, if you, I did want to include this because if you are doing something like that, you need to keep in mind how big around the wire is and how long it is. So that's just a, oh yeah, that's, that's a solenoid, that's a diagram for another day. So, <laughs> cool beans. I think we got through all of that with five minutes to spare. Questions? I know I talked even faster than I normally do tonight, but 
I really didn't think I was going to get through all the information. <laughs> so does that make sense to everybody? Do you get it? Make, it does? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. we got five minutes, so we're going to scroll on back through the beginning. Do it all over again. And do it all over again and see if I can do it in five minutes. Uh, no, I'm joking. I just want to leave it on this slide um, when, when we end. I just want to give everybody a reminder. Uh, I'm going to put the links to all of these websites. Uh, like I said, there is a direct uh, web page for this program on the TanglewoodChurch.com website, and I'm going to put a link to that in this video. Uh, I do encourage everybody to just go on there, read it, you know, check out the, the More Info tab on it. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, if it's something you want to be a part of, please reach out to us. Uh, to those of you that have already agreed to be a part of this, uh, couldn't be more thankful. Uh, really appreciate it, and we hope to do big things very, very soon. Uh, and obviously, I'll keep you guys all posted on, uh, you know, updated on that. And stay posted on our Facebook page here so that, uh, you know, you'll know when those raffles and auctions and things like that will come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't see the waiver. Yep, you're 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 uh, hands on now, buddy. Yeah, we're moving into your. Yeah, we're moving you into the uh, hands on part of this program. Uh, <laughs> all right. With that being said, let's pray and uh, and be dismissed. <clears throat> Father, thank you again. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, somebody would gain something from this class, Father, and I would pray that they would do so in your name, Father. We just pray that your hand would touch everything that we're trying to do here. And uh, we pray that you would be with anyone who may see this and everyone who is here in class with us today. And we pray safe travels until we can meet again. Uh, we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time, guys. Thank you. Thank you.